Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Structure Talk, a Structure Tech presentation. My name is Bill Ulrich, alongside Tessa Murray and Ruben Saltzman. As always, your three-legged stool coming to you from the Northland, talking all things houses, home inspections, and anything else that's rattling around in our brain. Well, we're in the middle of the summer here in Minnesota, which means that we have two seasons, yes. cold and hot, humid <laughs> as well. And on today's episode, we thought we'd talk a little bit about just some simple air conditioning maintenance items that should be done by homeowners every year. You know, if you're having issues with indoor air comfort or indoor air, Tessa, help me out here. It's not indoor air quality. It's just indoor comfort. comfort yeah, it's comfort. Yeah. All right. Yeah, That's right. Comfort. You got the right terms down, Bill. We will talk yeah. about some things that impact air quality too today. No, 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 no. They're all interrelated, all right. Bill. <laughs> all right. So let's do this. Uh, Ruben, Tessa, I should actually ask how you're doing. It's, it's uh, good to see your faces again. Good to see you too. Fantastic. Yeah, good 4th of July. Yeah, we just came off the 4th of July uh, weekend and I just spent time with my family and we, we saw some local fireworks. No one got hurt. I didn't get eaten alive by mosquitoes. So I think it was pretty successful. We had a cookout, you know, just your traditional uh, 4th of July celebration. What bubble do you live in that there were no mosquitoes inside it? <laughs> well, right? it's it's called lots of DEET, Bill. <laughs> I'm a terrible pet owner. Did you know you're not supposed to put mosquito spray with DEET on your dogs? I, Don't you use like like a deer tick bug medication a few times a year, like Frontline or something like that to keep the bugs off? Is that yeah, treat well, for mosquitoes we, too? We do, but there's also mosquito repellent you can put on your dogs. And I actually didn't know this in a couple of weeks ago, use it on my dog because they just get, you know, the mosquitoes are on them like instantly. And when you go up north, there's just swarms and swarms of them right now. And poor Bambino had welts, like large welts on him because the mosquitoes were just chewing on him so bad. But anyway, oh go to goodness. the pet store and get the proper mosquito spray or re mosquito repellent for your dogs. What's the, anyway. I'm just curious what the chemical is. If it's not deep, what do they put in it? That requires me reading the label, and <laughs> there's a little chance that's going to happen. So uh, I, let's do my man, internet research and move on. I've got a German Shepherd, and I have never once considered doing anything for him in the way of mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't crossed my mind until just now. Yeah, they would need a four-inch nose just to get through all that fur. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I think uh, they could. They might be able to get his nose. That's about it. How was your Should fourth come... of July, Ruben? Yeah. Oh man, I had a great time. We got a little rained out on the fourth, but the day before, oh man, we discovered a new game to play on the ping pong table. You guys yeah. have both had some some fun times. Yeah. We've had some competitive ping pong at the <laughs> yeah. Saltzman cabin. We got the ping pong table set up in the garage there. And oh, we had fun, but we we got a new game. This is called Polish ping pong. I think it's called, I think that's it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Polish ping pong. And it's basically, you, you take your two paddles, you set the paddle down on your side of the table, and the person opposing you has to take the ping pong ball and throw it. And if it hits the ping pong paddle, then you get the ball back and you get to hit the ball as hard as you can at the other person. With uh, And they're supposed to have their shirt off. <laughs> and it's like a free shot. And I think that's the hardest I have laughed in a long, <laughs> long time. Is there drinking involved with this game? It <laughs> reminds me this of is, This is at the cabin over the 4th of July. Yes. <laughs> um, I don't know, maybe. But it was a blast. Hey, yeah. Why are you picking on the polls? You know, it's an incredibly resilient community of people. I mean, as, I, as a proud I think they're, 25 percent or myself, I mean. Bill, I didn't invent the game. I didn't name the game. And I am praising how much fun this was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not picking on anybody. All so right, who, was the, right. who was the champ? There were no clear winners, but you look at all the welts on chess and there were, there were some clear losers. That was for sure. <laughs> I think for the first 20 minutes, we couldn't hit each other. But then it started to be every shot was a direct hit. To the belly button or the chest <laughs> and um it, it leaves well it's like getting hit with a paintball you wouldn't think a, a ping pong ball would do that but no offense but the next funny. time the next time we go up to the saltman cabin for something i don't think i'll be playing polish ping pong 
Well, yeah, I don't we'll think see. you have to worry about that. There were we'll no see. ladies involved in this game, were there, Ruben? No, there were not. <laughs> Little awkward family moments when uh, you know your sisters and your mom are like taking their shirts off so you can actually find skin to hit them with. So the boys. Yeah. Are, okay, the let's boys move along. All right, yeah, yeah, moving along. <laughs> I'll say. Sorry. I will say. My dad came out to watch. And he lasted about 10 seconds and he shook his head in disgust and walked, walked back out. <laughs> I, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's, let's get to, uh, back to business here. All right. It's hot out. You know, if, if you're feeling it inside, you, you might want to look at a couple of these items that Ruben's going to talk about and just make sure this little maintenance tidbit is taken care of. It might help enormously. So Ruben, let, let's start at the top. What do you uh, what do you do each year with your air conditioning system? Probably numbers one, two, and three. I'm gonna go out of order the way I've got it written down in my blog, but uh, probably the biggest one is simply changing your filter. Now, a lot of people think about the furnace filter and they think, well, you gotta change your filter during the winter time when your furnace is running, but for most homes in Minnesota, they've got what's called a split system where it simply uses your furnace's blower fan and it distributes all of the same air throughout the house. So you need to change your furnace filter, whether it's AC or heat. And if you don't have that changed, you're going to have a big reduction in airflow. And th there was, I mean, great case in point. Well, hold on, let me back up. When you have a big reduction in airflow, it means that you're not going to be dissipating. Well, you're, you're not going to be removing all of the heat from the air that you should. And so as the air passes over that evaporator coil, it's, it's going to be going much more slowly. And the air coming out is actually going to be colder because you don't have as much warm air passing over that coil. And th there was a, an inspection I went along. I went with Corey just recently and we were doing our typical test. We always test the temperature of the air going into the furnace and the air coming out. And well, I shouldn't really say the furnace, I should say the evaporator coil for the air conditioner. We always compare the temperature of the air to, in to out. And you know, generally we're looking for something in the range of about 15 to 20 degrees. It, you know, there's a lot of variables. You can't simply say it, it only dropped 14 degrees, therefore it's a problem, or it it dropped 23 degrees and it's malfunctioning. I mean, there's a lot of variables, but generally we're looking for a difference about 15 to 20 degrees. Now, if if you don't have the airflow going over there, and that's what we had at this house, we checked the air coming out and it was way colder than it should have been. And we started thinking, hmm, is this not working right? What's going on? And then we happened to get to the furnace filter and it was one of those ones where it's designed for a four inch filter, mm -hmm. but the homeowner had installed four one inch super allergen filters. Wow. So <laughs> each one is gonna be way more restrictive. It's not, I mean, four filters is gonna be four times the filtration and four Harder times the reduction in airflow. Yes, yeah. yes. And so we, we fixed it. We took out three of the filters and all of a sudden, the temperature difference went back to normal. It went back to what it should be. Hmm. And it, it was it was a perfect example of what you're going to have if you've got a really dirty air filter. It's just gonna, not going to be doing what it should. Hmm. And if I were a little bit smarter, I could explain exactly what was happening to the refrigerant. I could probably stumble through it if I really thought through it. I've learned this many times, but just, just trust us to say it's not good for it. <laughs> <laughs> and it can cause your air conditioner to malfunction. So extremely important to change your furnace filter even throughout the summer. Air conditioning is like magic. It's just magic. How it, how it can remove warm air and then throw it to the outside, which is even warmer. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree, Bill. That explained. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah, the okay. filter not only, I mean, is an important part of the system operating properly, but Bill, this is how it ties in with, with air quality too, comfort in air quality. Got to stay on top of changing that filter, people. Why? What's the air quality part of this? Well, filters, you know, are, are catching all the gunk and um, depending on the MERV rating you have, you know, it can catch smaller and smaller particles, but it's important to change it regularly to uh, make sure that you're monitoring not only air quality in your house, but just the functioning of your system to your furnace and your AC 
the more clogged the filter gets, the uh, like Ruben said, the more it's going to restrict airflow. If you've got, you know, if it's wintertime, you're heating your house, it can put stress on the blower fan in the furnace. And in the summertime, it can, like Ruben said, slow down the amount of air going over the evaporator coil, which can cause problems with the system overall. And it can really chill the air down more than it should be. So it can create wreak havocs within the you know, heating and cooling systems if it's really dirty, but it, and, it's counterintuitive. Well, the dirtier the filter is, the more it's going to slow down the air and actually the more gunk it's going to catch, but it can harm your systems. And and talking about just the, the health of your house, how it negatively impacts it, it means that the air coming out of the registers is, is going to be colder than it should be. You're not going to have nearly as much airflow, but it will be colder. It'll make some surfaces much colder than they should be. You can end up with a lot of sweating on the ductwork because it's so cold. You know, just like having a cold drink, it's going to collect condensation in a lot of areas where it shouldn't. And you also don't have as much humidity removal because you don't have that air passing over the evaporator coil. So mm -hmm. you end up with spot areas that are much colder and you have a more humid house than you should have. So, and those things can lead to mold growth. Yeah. All we right. talked about too, how oversizing the AC system can lead to issues with higher humidity too, with short cycling and, you know, the AC kicking on and cooling the house down real fast and shutting off before it has a chance to run and actually remove the humidity from the air. So that's another problem that's separate from that. But that's a good point, Ruben, about cooling off surfaces and creating condensation issues too, which can obviously lead to mold growth and other problems. A home inspector is never going to look at a unit to see if it's sized properly, right? There, There's math involved in that that's sort of beyond what home inspectors do. For the most part, I mean, we we, we do look at them. And when, when you've got a unit that looks like it's really small, every once in a while, I'll, I'll take a peek and I'll, I'll look at the model number and I'll see what, what the tonnage is. And if you've got like a 5,000 square foot house and you've got a one and a half ton unit, I mean, I don't need to be proficient with sizing systems to know that this is surely undersized and vice versa. You got, you got some tiny little house and you got a three ton unit. It's probably really oversized and you know, we, we're not doing any calculations, but we've got a general idea of what it kind of should be. Uh, I, I don't I don't think I've ever come across a house where I said, hey, look, this is severely oversized or undersized. Usually it's close enough. So we, we've replaced filters. Life is clean on the inside of your ductwork at this point. What else are you looking for? Okay. So there's another maintenance tip that we're going to give listeners here, and that would be to keep the condensing coil. That's the, the part of the AC that's sitting outside of your house, that big kind of box out in your yard the condensing coil, condenser, keep that clean because if that gets really dirty and plugged too, that will reduce the efficiency of the unit as well. Yeah, the, the way it works is it's bringing in outdoor air to actually dissipate that heat. It's sucking in air on all the sides. And if you ever put your hand above that unit when it's running, you'll notice the air coming out is really warm and that's heat that it's, it is removing mm -hmm. from your house. And if it can't dissipate that heat, it's not gonna work right, like Tessa said. And those things do get nasty. I mean, especially if you've got cottonwood trees in your neighborhood, Oh yeah, man, it is a cottonwood magnet. And, and if you got a bunch of those, you'll need to definitely clean it every year. But, but also it, grass clippings. Yeah. We'll, we'll see some of these where people got the lawnmower shooting out grass on there and they will just be impacted with mm -hmm. grass clippings. So look for any dirt, dust, debris, mm -hmm. cottonwood seeds, all that stuff. And this might be obvious too, but a lot of times we'll see like overgrowth of vegetation around AC units that, you know, choke it off too. So make sure you trim back any plants or bushes, keep the area surrounding it clear. Yeah. And I, I, I know there was something at, at my house where it was, it was kind of unsightly. It was like, you can see it from the road at my last house. And, and we had some discussion at my house about maybe putting up a trellis or maybe some type of decorative box to go around it. And of course I had a firm, no, we are not doing anything of the sort. I, I know it would look better. If anything, maybe we could put up a wall to kind of hide it from the street. 
and make it a few feet away from the unit, but that's it. And I, I've seen some people go way overboard trying to trying to make their AC look a little bit better, mm -hmm. but you really reduce the cooling capacity of the unit when you do that. So don't put anything around it. You ever seen the, uh, the poor condensing unit that is the tree trunk for the family dog that oh, is, yes, uh, accidentally rotted away? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Urine is extremely corrosive and you always know it because it's like one corner of the unit is completely disintegrated going, going down from about, you know, doggy leg height down. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that it, there's a major impact on, on the ability to cool your house if, if something like that's going on, or is it just get Fido off because long-term you don't want all four corners of your unit? Roddy. Yeah, I, I think it's more like that. I mean, you'd probably just calculate the surface area that you've lost because of your dog peeing on it. And it's, you know, <laughs> probably going to be, I usually see it somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 20% of, of the fins are, are burned off or, you know, I'm probably exaggerating when I say 20%. That, I would <laughs> guess that's about the reduction you'd have in cooling capacity. So it's going to be less, but it's not, not the end of the world. Hey, one question I want to ask you, Ruben, do you have any tips for homeowners that want to try and clean that off themselves? Like, because I know you can hire, you know, an HVAC contractor to come out and they, you know, do tune-ups and stuff like that. And they can clean your condensing coil at the same time. But like for a homeowner that wants to do it themselves, what would be some tips you'd have for them? Uh, I'd say start by getting your pressure washer and <laughs> not bringing it anywhere close to your unit because <laughs> you will destroy it. Just simply use your garden hose, get the sprayer on your garden hose and spray it down. As long as you can see the little aluminum fins. Now there's some of those where they've got these shrouds that go over and you can't really get a jet of water to go in there. In that case, you got to kind of take off the outside of it. That, that gets to be kind of a pain in the butt. And at that point, I think most people would probably say, eh, maybe I want to hire an HVAC contractor to come out and do this. But if you can see the little aluminum fins, by all means, get a garden hose, get a sprayer on the end of it, and you can usually just spray everything right down. Mine doesn't have fins. It's got these like little tiny little whisker like thing. Have you seen that before? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I have. Yeah. Like a pipe cleaner almost? Yes. Yeah. It, it's, if you go up to it, like, you know, the fins normally look like your air conditioner, like you'd have in a wall unit where rough them up, they lay down and they're perfectly flat. Metal. But yeah. Yeah. Mine actually look like little pieces of grass are stuck in there, but it's not. It's just the, hmm. it's, it's the fin cooling system that it came, came out of the box that way. Hey, can I ask an uh, off the wall question here about condensing units? Uh, R22 and the new refrigerant, is there a, uh, is there anything, Ruben, that you can share with the audience for people who have systems with R22? Is there a replacement now for that coolant or not? not that I'm aware of, no. We as far as I know, it's out. just R22. Well, we right. we did a podcast on that a while ago. We may have done more than one. And just, mm -hmm. just to back up for anybody who's a little bit lost at your question, Bill, normally you're the one who backs us up. There's, there's an older type of refrigerant that they don't use anymore called the R22. It says it right on the data plate, what, what type of refrigerant your system has. They phased out the R22 and all that's being used today, all that I've ever seen, that is, is something called R410A. It's supposed to be a lot more environmentally friendly and that's all they've been using for a long time now. So if you've got a system that still uses the older refrigerant and you've got a refrigerant leak and you need to refill it, R22 is still available, it's just not being made, and it costs you an arm and a leg to get it. So that that's the big concern. But okay. as far as replacing it, I, the last I heard, it was basically cost prohibitive. Okay, okay. But there's no, that you're aware of, no replacement for that, that will work in those systems, but it isn't R22 and it isn't for, what did you say, R410A? Yeah. Yeah, okay. nothing that I'm well, aware of. that's fine. What else are we looking at? Well, we've been outside, we've cleaned the condensing unit, we've re removed the filter, replaced the filter. Where, where else are you going? What else are you doing? The last one, this is one that sometimes people forget about and it can lead to a mess, is your condensate line. You know, we, we talk about an air conditioner has two jobs. It removes heat from the air and it removes moisture from the air. And all that moisture drains down as condensate and then it's going to go down this little pipe and it's going to go to a, 
a safe place for disposal. In Minnesota homes, in the basement, it's usually going to be to a floor drain. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just make sure that you're paying attention to where it's going. You don't have family members like kicking that drainage hose loose and having it then leak behind the furnace and get into some carpet in a finished space of the basement or just go anywhere that it shouldn't. You know, the, the current requirement for an AC condensate line is that you need to use approved material. The, the Minnesota Mechanical Code has a list of materials that are approved. One of those that's not approved is a garden hose. <laughs> I know we've seen our share of those, but you, you need to have the right type of material. And it's also supposed to be large enough to help reduce the potential for it getting clogged. And that, that would mean a three quarter inch line or larger. And for anyone that's listening that doesn't, you know, isn't familiar with the anatomy of a, you know, a, an AC system, where would they find this condensate line typically? Well, the evaporator coil, it's, you know, it's half of the air conditioner is going to sit right on top of your furnace. It's usually going to be a different colored box. You're going to see a couple of tubes going into it. One is going to be an insulated tube. It's going to be fairly large. And the other is going to be a really small tube. And they both come right into the front of the top of the furnace with the evaporator coil, they go right into it. And then you're going to have one more pipe coming out of that evaporator coil, which is the condensate drain. And if you follow it down, it's typically going to head right over to your floor drain. And usually it's like a clear plastic tube, um, typically, but not always. Yeah, it, it could be. I, I've seen a lot of clear plastic. More commonly, they'd be using PVC, white mm -hmm. plastic, salt, True. rigid white plastic, or yeah. CPVC, which yeah. kind of has a yellowish tint to it. Mm -hmm. Most of what I see on, on new installations is going to be one of those two materials. Something. Which seems to be beneficial because it seems like a lot of times those clear plastic lines get kinked yep. or bent and, you know, and then that completely, you know, eliminates its effectiveness. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Now, then, but there could be some units where it's not above a furnace where someone has added a, you know, a AC system to their house and maybe they just have an air handler instead of having a furnace, right? And it, we see houses in Minnesota where people have added air conditioning to an older house and that AC system is separate. They've got like a boiler for the yeah. heat source in the house and then they've added yep. central air later for cooling and they've put, you know, an air handler up in the attic somewhere. So that might be something to be aware of is you could have, you know, part of the system sitting in an attic. And so what we've talked about changing the filter and checking the condensate line requires you to go into the attic space and access those things. Sometimes in a, in a and now that I talk about this, you're going to, you're going to, it's going to jog your memory test in a lot of those houses where they've retrofit an AC unit and they put it in the attic, they end up putting the filter in the living space. So you've just got the return. You got a big return in yeah. the upper level hallway and you yes. can just loosen a couple of clips as you can change your filter without actually having to go in the attic. Good point. We see a yeah. lot of those. Yeah. And if, if you have one of those and you're not going in your attic regularly, I implore you <laughs> go in your attic regularly <laughs> and check on that condensate situation yeah. because you get a leak up there and it is going to be a mess. We've seen so many ceilings destroyed because they had a condensate leak up there and it didn't get caught. And there's a bunch of rules in the mechanical code about dealing with condensate if it's in an area where it can cause damage. Now, when you've got your furnace set up in the basement, you've just got a concrete floor, there's no special rules. You do whatever you want. The idea is if it, if it leaks onto the floor, it's going to go to the floor drain. There's no damage to the structure. But if a condensate leak could cause damage to the structure, there's a whole list of ways to help prevent that damage. And it might be, I, I don't have them all memorized, but I have blogged about it. it. It might be a big emergency drain pan where you've got a pan that sticks out on all sides of the unit in your attic, and it's going to catch any water that would go in there. And if that pan fills up with water, it's going to have a little float switch that'll shut your system down, or it might have a secondary drain in the pan. And the secondary drain would have to drain to a conspicuous location. And it means it's not going to be the same place as, as, as your primary drain. It's going to be like, I don't know, I, I, I've heard a good place would be above a sink, like, <laughs> like a little <laughs> pipe sticking out of your ceiling. And if, it, if there, you do have water coming out of there, 
it's like heads up you got a problem no i've never seen somebody do that in a residential setting yeah i've heard it happens in commercial Uh, settings is it i've seen the little pipes sticking out of the soffit on the exterior of a house before where you know they're draining it out the side and yeah is that okay can you do well i You can. I mean, I would think that that's probably the primary drain, the primary condensate drain. Yeah. But for a secondary drain to let you know that we got a problem and we shouldn't have water coming out here, I I guess that depends on somebody's definition of a conspicuous location. I would argue it's not. Right. I mean, who the heck is going to notice that? (laughs) Well, if you put it right above your door when you walk out and it can dip (laughs) on your head in the middle of summer when you you have an overhang. Yes. That would be a conspicuous location. Yeah. Yeah. Like normally I don't have water coming out. Now I do. What's up? Yeah. Those mechanicals don't belong in attic spaces. I know there's no place to put them. I mean, there's just nowhere else to go, but it doesn't seem like a great idea. Well, and but what are the options? I mean, you're going to retrofit a system in an existing house and run ductwork in finished spaces. It's so much easier in an attic because you've got access to everything. You can just run your ducks right up there. I mean, it it makes a lot of sense why they do it. But on the other hand, I am with you, Bill. They don't Mm -hmm. belong up there. (laughs) Agreed. Let's just, let's just uh, agree that mini splits maybe are a more building science friendly way to cool a house in a retrofit situation. Yes. Yeah. Those things are really gaining in popularity. They have been for some time. Yeah. Well, have you seen a new air handler in the last five years? I mean, everything's mini splits now, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I can't so imagine why you do you it. You have to run all that that piping still and cut holes in the ceiling, and I mean, that's yeah. your tell if you have an air handler in your attic, right? If you look up in the bedroom and there's those, how big is that hole? Inch and a half, two inches, something like that. They're they're small holes, but it's like under high force. Oh, are you talking about supply registers for a high velocity system? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like the, the high velocity systems have like a little circle round hole that the air shoots out of and it's, they're pretty small, but I know yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. I but wasn't thinking about that system. Go in your attic. All right. Is there anything else you need to be working on? One other thing, just a little tip. And I got this from Allison Bales. He's got uh, the Energy Vanguard blog. He had blogged about this many years ago about how he had a clogged condensate drain line and how he fixed it. And one of the inspectors on our team, Melind, ended up using the same trick. And he said it worked like a charm. He did exactly what he suggested, totally unclogged his condensate line. And it was a matter of getting a shop back, or I should say a wet dry back, and getting some fittings from the hardware store to reduce the size of his nozzle on his shop vac down to the exact same size as the condensate drain line. Hmm. He hooked up his shop vac to the condensate drain line, made, made sure it was all airtight and just flipped it on and let it run for about 15 minutes. And he sucked out just a ridiculous amount of gunk and goop and oh. this all this black stuff that had accumulated inside the condensate line as well as the evaporator coil. I mean, those evaporator coils get nasty. So after running that for a long time, he sucked everything out and he didn't have any more leaks in his condensate line. It wasn't uh, wasn't overflowing onto the furnace anymore. So I thought that was a, a super easy, super genius move yeah. if you have a, a clogged condensate. That's a pretty awesome website. How, how do you spell Allison's name? Well, it's- Allison is the traditional spelling. And and Bales is B A I L E S. The the website is if if you Google the Energy Vanguard blog, you could find that you could find that website. And Tessa and I were talking before the show. We're gonna try to get him on as a guest. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we've got that kind of pull to get him on, but never hurts to ask. We'll certainly yeah. try. Yeah, All we right. had him out to Minnesota to teach at a mm-hmm. uh, at a conference once. So. Maybe, maybe I could try. Let's put a wrap on today's episode. If you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable, check these three areas and uh, maybe that's as simple as it is. If not, call your local HVAC company and have them come out and get you squared away. It's nothing worse than sweating in your house in the middle of summer. All right. You've been listening to Structure Talk, a Structure Tech presentation. My name is Bill Ulrich alongside Tessa Murray and Ruben Saltzman. Thanks for listening. And Ruben, as always, tell people where to send questions just in case they want to. Email us at podcast at structuretech.com. Podcast at structuretech.com. Send in your questions. We're going to be recording a Q&A episode in the very near future.
All right. So we'll, we'll get this figured out. Maybe year four, we'll remember to say that on a regular basis. But we want to say thank you for everybody who listens. We appreciate it. And we will catch you next time. For more information on how we can provide you with the right information about your home before you buy or sell, contact us at StructureTech.com. Thank you.